Greetings, greetings, greetings to Augies worldwide, uh, all over here. We've got uh, Europe, several places in Europe, <coughs> Canada, uh, and so on. It's just great, great to see you all today. This is uh, a beautiful Saturday in Colorado, except for the fact that it's raining outside right now. Temperature dropped all the way to 82 during the rain. <coughs> yeah, we had quite a winter uh, looking at uh, some of the comments that I'm seeing on uh, the other parts of the screen. Um, let's see, announcements. I'm going to the Reno Hamfest, which will be this coming weekend on Friday and Saturday. It's not on Sunday, just Friday and Saturday. So we're taking off a little early so that my wife can drive on into the Bay Area to see an old friend of hers um, in San Ramon. And uh, then she'll come back up, rejoin me, and, and we'll head back across the desert. Uh, the route we're taking and planning on is U.S. Highway 50, which through Nevada is known as the loneliest highway in the world. Uh, I'm hoping it's not so lonely it doesn't have gas stations. <laughs> We've got to get that. I've actually been checking out the few towns along the way via uh, Google to see if they actually have gas stations there. I've been just, you know, looking at the aerial view. can usually tell them pretty easily, especially when Google uh, annotates them as what they are. So uh, we'll see. It'll be very, uh, very low uh, populated. Uh, it says uh, Allocated Brain is going to take his tech test tomorrow and uh, is doing well in the practice exam. So very good for you. It will soon be uh, welcome to Ham Radio. Looks like, um, uh, let's see, uh, from Houston, um, Vidya Gomez um, is celebrating uh, just passing uh, to uh, upgrading to general today. She's nine years old. My daughter was nine years old when um, I'm going to cut that, turn down this mic. Joan says it's clipping a bit. I think that did something. If it's uh, clipping still, I can cut that one. The problem with this microphone is there are about three places in the system where you can change the uh, gain and they're all concatenated and so it's possible to get clipping at any one of those. Um, well, I'm going to try it straight up there and we'll see what happens. This is the mic that I'm using. It's a, a Chinese mic that I reviewed fairly recently um, on uh, one of my videos. It's been a good mic, but it seems a little picky to set up. Um, so tell me if uh, uh, the, the mic gain is there just a little bit. Uh, Johan, I uh, got an email from another 14-year-old ham who wants to get in touch with you. So um, I'll have to have you uh, email me at hamradioanswers at gmail.com and tell me if you're willing to uh, let me make that uh, those introductions for you. Uh, it's another ham who's 14 years old. Um, so, let's see. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, audio's fine, much better. Okay, I turned it down. So hopefully that'll be be better. You know that it's Windows. <laughs> They've got so many different places inside that you can adjust the volume that uh, it's possible to get clipping even though you've turned everything that you can see down. Some um, volume level is too high in another area. Okay, um, let's see. So I'll be in Reno. I don't know if I'll be doing a Saturday live stream uh, this coming Saturday. It will depend on my internet connection in Reno. If I have a good internet connection, I'll probably do a live stream. Uh, do it right from the uh, 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 Hamvention there, and, or Ham, uh, Hamfest there. I guess Dayton has a copyright on the term, or a trademark on the term Hamvention. Um, 
Okay, well, very good. Boy, still more people from all over everywhere. Another announcement is that um, at the request of some of the people who were patrons on Patreon, I've set up uh, on um, PayPal a subscription feature, which works just like Patreon, but uh, PayPal takes less money than Patreon does. So you go to the same place you would go for a tip, uh, which would be at uh, ke0og slash, or .net slash tip hyphen jar. And just below the regular tip spot is a place where you can do a subscription if you want to. Uh, or you can just do it through Patreon. Either way uh, is fine. And I, I, I want everybody who provides, whether it's a tip or a, a Patreon or whatever, uh, how much I appreciate that because it really helps me uh, keep doing this and when I need equipment I can get it and also some of the equipment I want to test um, uh, the vendor doesn't seem real interested in sending me one to test so I'll buy it and uh, test it that way I did that with the buddy pole and uh, was was pleased with what I had there um, my latest review was of the D878 UV Plus, which is an AnyTone radio that has Bluetooth that is supposed to connect with uh, your car stereo so you can have hands-free operation while you're driving. And uh, I tried that out and, and uh, concluded that it needs just a little bit more work. Um, probably the hardware is okay and there'll be a firmware update coming out that will make it a little bit better. Okay, I, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Johnny Cash said he did some interesting things in Reno. I can imagine. It is, after all, Nevada. My parents were married not far from there. They eloped when they were uh, both uh, in their 20s. Let's see, Dad was 25, and so was my mom. They eloped to Carson City, Nevada, which is the state capital, and got married there. I don't, I never really did figure out the reason that they did that. Uh, my grandfather said uh, he bought a new suit for the wedding and was disappointed that he didn't get to wear it. So, uh, I don't know. They, they um, were married uh, uh, an awful long time, well over 50 years, so, and had five children from the marriage, so. Um, purchased uh, an SSB filter, no clue what impedance is. Uh, the usual impedance for those things is 50 ohms. Uh, building a QRP rig and using this commercial ICOM filter. Any clue on how to find the impedance of the filter? Try it with an antenna analyzer. Put a load on it. And on the output, put your antenna analyzer on the input and see what you get. Um, probably uh, could tell you a little bit more. Okay, so with those announcements, let's go to uh, taking a look. Um, I, I had such a huge stack of questions. Um, I took uh, a look through them today and pulled out some that I can answer with just a simple short email. And so these are some of the rest. They're not necessarily in order. <clears throat> This one is from Catherine Smith, KL4QZ, and she shows a picture of what she is doing. So let's go up here, and, uh, whoa, thought I had it up. Apparently I didn't. Well, it was up. Uh, let's see if I go to Gmail and change that to... Um, ham radio answers and shoot anyway okay um, here is what she has done let's just see if we can't find her email uh, KL4QZ KL4QZ Catherine Smith okay here are some photos that she had um, of her uh, situation. Boy, these could be bigger, couldn't they? Um, they are um, 
out in a, a field here in the mountains, and she's trying to uh, cre uh, r reduce RFI problems, and she's done all of these uh, serially like this, which you can do, uh, or you could put the four toroids together and wind them all at the same time. This approach has less capacitance, um, in induced capacitance, uh, so actually should be a dB or two better on reduction. But that's not really uh, the problem that she has. Um, the problem that she has is she's getting QRM from their, they're in a motor home, and they're getting uh, interference from uh, the generator and the camper's 12 volt water pump. Okay, now <clears throat> what you need to do, uh, Catherine, is reduce the um, the emissions at the source. You're going to need to put um, a filter on the output of your generator. Um, there was an allusion to this uh, in the QST a few years ago that reviewed the common 2 kilowatt inverter style generators and they talked about the fact that they all put out RFI and that they would need to uh, put a filter. A line filter like that for RFI is different from running it through toroids. You'll have to do some research on the internet. As far as the 12 volt water pump you're going to need to go in there and put um, toroids around the uh, power lead right at the water pump, okay? Usually the water pump is readily available uh, because it needs to be gotten at easily for uh, winterization. They make little snap-on ferrites that have two halves like a clamshell and then they'll clamp over the wire. So put a string of uh, five or six of those on the um, lead to your water pump and that will really help. Okay, so that's what I would suggest doing there. Uh, and leave the toroids in place on the other. That, that helps a little bit with common mode noise. Um, okay, um, let's see what we've got here. Um, he like to see a series in antenna modeling. I did a video or two on antenna modeling a while back. You might do a search on those. Um, how, did I get my 24 volt solar panel working? Yes, it is working. Uh, the solar system is back up and functional. Um, I wanted to get a little more information on the controller that I have um, and then do a video about it. Um, when are the QSX uh, going to be available? Well, according to Hans Summers, um, G0UPL, I think is his call sign, uh, it'll be done sometime in November 1918. Not 19, um, oh, dear, good grief, 2018. I'm 100 years off, 2018. In other words, he's way behind. And he is not indicating when the uh, radios will be available. It's just soon. Um, I think he's suffering from um, I think he's suffering rather badly from it. Um, the QCX radio, which I've had now for well, well over a year, more than that, uh, was finally reviewed in this month's QST. They gave a very nice glowing review of it. Uh, toroids look like flowers. Oh, yes. What is a good ground for a condo? Well, first put your station together. Um, in your power supply, you'll pick up the utility ground. And if you have need of further grounding and you can't get to the ground, uh, MFJ makes an artificial ground. It's actually... Uh, a tunable counterpoise that can help uh, reduce uh, RFI. Okay, this is from um, Miguel, KI5FJI. says, I recently got my tech and obtained an ICOM ID51A. 
and started experimenting with D-Star. I'm now looking for a headset, but the commercial ones are priced at 30% of the radio value. Well, the radio value on that is over $300. Uh, the Japanese gear is still uh, considerably more expensive than even the best uh, Chinese gear. Um, I did look up a headset for you, um, and let me get up on the top screen here. This is a um, microphone with an ear boom, and it's got a little attachment that comes around the ear like that, okay? And... Um, uh, it's just on a single ear and there's also a little push to talk button right there so this uh, microphone is available for thirty dollars from icom and it's designed for the icom and you can call them or you can get this at hro or dx engineering or wherever your local mfj products are found and uh, should probably work uh, pretty well for you Okay, now let's go back to the main screen. Uh, this is from uh, John Brooks, KD5RJK. It said he had a stroke in June. Um, no, 09, 19, uh, 2009. Had a stroke. Luckily, I already had my technician license. Um, Getting my general took about eight years of study because of cognitive damage. Anyway, can I offer you a donation for a code plug? Well, I wouldn't take a donation for a code plug. I'd just give it to you for free. Um, I looked up where he lives. He is in Commerce City, which is in the Denver metro area. Now, I know that there are clubs there that will um, uh, that run the various digital repeaters, DMR repeaters, and they have code plugs so if you do a little research and you know you find your digital repeaters um, and then look up the call sign of the um, oh, what do they call it the anyway the person that runs the repeater the, the trustee the trustee of the repeater very often they have ready-made code plugs for you so that's what I would suggest that you do. Uh, every radio's code plug is a little bit different. This is DMR, digital mobile radio here. And the sum total of all the programming in the radio is called a code plug. And that should get you squared away. This next one is from uh, William, no, Bill uh, Curlew, KC1JTS. Asked a question in May. I've been watching all the weekly vids. Is there any way to tell if my question got covered or not? Uh, I don't. I'm minus an assistant right now, so I don't keep track of uh, which questions I answer with which videos. So uh, you'll have to listen in. If you want to ask me the question again, uh, forward that same email to me and uh, ask the question again and I'll I'll get you an answer uh, for that okay um, this is from Michael Gerardo uh, Yankee Delta 1 MIC okay uh, he's from Indonesia and he wants to ask about a double and triple bazooka antenna how it works and compared to a dipole uh, which one has more dB gain? And have I tried to simulate these antennas in MMANA-GAL? Uh, I have heard about that antenna modeling software. I've never used it. Let's go to the overhead. Um, and... Okay. Let's take a J-pole antenna. Okay, uh, the dimensions are a little bit off. Um, no, I don't want to use green. Okay, this part is a half wave. Okay, half wave. This part is one quarter wave matching stub right here. And you feed it down here toward the bottom. 
a, a quarter wave stub has the effect that if shorted at the bottom, the impedance at the other end is very high. And so this becomes a good match to the half wave. Well, there's nothing that says you can't turn that on its side and put a half wave uh, dipole up, feed it at the end with a quarter wavelength uh, close to the bottom and you'll feed it somewhere in there. Okay, And this is uh, sometimes called a ZEP um, but now there's something interesting that you can do with this antenna if you want to and it's um, very simple. MFJ sells one just like this for 20 meters, 40, stuff like that. They've got the matching stub and an end fed and it only works on one band. Okay, now if this, which is balanced, can feed one half wave antenna, why can't it feed another half wave antenna? And this will be out of um, out of phase with the other one, of course. So if this one has current on it like this, this will have current on it like this. Okay, so you get a whole wavelength long. Now, the thing about this, if you look at the pattern, um, the radiation pattern on this, if you look at, um, and we're looking down, so this is north, the, if the antenna is this way, okay, the radiation pattern, I'm sorry, I've got that wrong. That's a nice thing about a whiteboard, you can make it right very easily. Um, it'll look like this, okay, whereas a regular dipole, just a dipole, will be more like this. Okay, so you lose a little off the sides and you gain some uh, in right in the middle. And remember the antennas going that way. And you gain more this way. So yes, you do get gain. You also get loss. Okay, uh, because the beam is now uh, shaped a little bit more. But that does work, and if, if you want to, say, put up an antenna, and, uh, like, let's say that you're in <clears throat> Southern California and you want an antenna that points at the East Coast, you could put in something like this and really focus the energy in a bit more, and all you need is a full wavelength of wire and some ladder line that's a quarter, this is a quarter wavelength long. And... I'm sure there's a formula somewhere where, where to put that tap, uh, but that's where you feed it. Like I said, MFJ makes these. They're ready-made. You can get them for less than $100. Okay, hope that helps. Let's go back to the live stream here. Um, um, did um, I get my panel working? Yes, yes. Um, audio just dropped out for 30 seconds. I'm sorry if that happened. I've got a green on this end indicating a good link. Um, the Netherlands, hello. Nice USB headset I use on my computer anyway to use it on my 746 Pro. Um, the pinout is different. Um, plus... I know the Kenwood radios actually use uh, the mic connection itself to put it in the transmit. And there's a resistor sitting inside that plug. Uh, the ICOM, I don't think they do it quite that way. Um, do you, what version firmware are you using when you tested the D878UV Plus? Version 13. 1.13. Okay, has anyone seen flat earthers going on about scalar waves, Ray Tesla? Tesla was an interesting fellow. He was brilliant. Um, like so many brilliant people in his era, he did most of his good work while young. 
Uh, and that's true of Einstein also. He did his general relativity work when he was a young man uh, working for the uh, Swiss post office. Uh, Tesla, uh, like most brilliant scientists, did some really, really good stuff. He invented the induction motor, which is used everywhere. Your computer has an induction motor in it for the fan. Um, <clears throat> but he um, also did some weird stuff. His trying to transmit electricity through the air uh, to power things is something that's never been realized. And uh, um, some of his, yeah, it's just, he did some bad stuff beside the good stuff. <clears throat> I think on the bazooka, you know, I'm going to have to look that up. That's a good question. Uh, the du the zep, same thing as the double bazooka. This was a double zep that I drew for you here. Um, go to rmham.org website, have sample code plugs. Okay, there you go. Well, samples. Um, Rocky Mountain Ham Radio site is rmham. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, Tesla. Uh, I mean, considering what he did for the electrical industry, he is worthy of a great deal of respect and being termed a great man. And he was that. Um, but um, in later years, he had a, a bunch of um, ideas, some of which panned out and some didn't. Um, in the United States, um, the Supreme Court ruled that he preceded Marconi in the invention of radio. Uh, now, one of the reasons the Supreme Court did that is because then we didn't have to pay Marconi any more patent fees or um, licensing fees. Um, Tesla did invent it, but he did not commercialize it. That's what Marconi's big contribution was, was uh, uh, commercializing and turning it into a viable commercial system. Uh, and that's why the radios on board the Titanic uh, were Marconi and not Tesla. Um, it's like uh, Edison. Edison did not invent the electric light bulb. But what he did invent was a complete system from coal coming one end, going into the boilers, running the generators, wires out to lights. He invented that complete system. And so he is credited in the United States with inventing the light bulb. In England, by the way, they think Joseph Swan did it. Um, okay, some people are still trying to do the math and the unified theory, and they have not made that work. Um, oh, man, I'm getting way off on a tangent here. Uh, Einstein spent his life trying to develop a unified field theory uh, that would encompass gravitation at great distances all the way down to quantum effects at subatomic levels. He was never able to do that. No one else has done it either. Uh, some people claim you can do it with string theory, but that uh, pro once promising avenue has kind of faded a little bit into the background. It is still an unsolved problem in physics to match gravitation on the galactic scale with uh, quantum uh, behavior at the uh, subatomic scale. And the problem is that the two keep getting tangled up in each other. Uh, but they have that's an unsolved problem. If you want to become a physicist and solve that problem, you will have mankind's eternal gratitude. Um, yes, um, Marconi could not find people to um, fund his radio adventures in Italy, so that's why he went to the United Kingdom uh, to do it there. And it was the Royal Navy that was very interested because he demonstrated that you could communicate with ships at sea. Uh, Swan beat Edison by one year to the light bulb where there were several other people who beat both of them to an electric light bulb. But they did not make practical light bulbs. Edison invented a practical system. And over in um, the UK, they... Uh, had their own developments. I mean, all the technologies Edison used were available. It was just, 
he screwed them together and made them work. Okay, this is from Gregory Forster, uh, Forster KD9JTI. He says, I'm looking at the My Antennas NFED Halfwave 8010 and 4010 and the uh, MFJ 1984 and 1982 antennas. Let's go see what that is. And go to the top screen to MFJ Enterprise and we'll look up the MFJ 1984. 84. There we go. Okay, this is NFED halfwave antenna. Um, they're going to be about the same thing. Um, I'm trying to think. I may have tested that. Um, and I ran into some trouble. Um, 1984 and uh, 1982. Let's see what the 2 is. Let's see if the 2 is. NFED 80 to 10. Um, go go look that up um, in, on my video page because I believe I did a video about that. I had issues with it, okay? I had issues. It was designed really for portable work. These two are designed for portable work um, where you're very close to the uh, ballon right there, and you need to run a counterpoise on that too, which they don't provide. Um, so I believe that my antennas is more designed for a permanent installation, whereas these I found uh, I had terrible time getting them to work. Finally, had to call MFJ, and they told me that um, you know how to do it, and I did it, and it worked. But um, uh, it's really designed for portable work. You've got to have the radio right near that little ballon. Um, Okay, let's, where are we? Here we are. Let me go back to the, the headshot there. Okay. Um, oh, would it be feasible to drape the antenna over the treetops using a drone? Uh, yes, it can be done. People do it. The hard thing will be getting the drone to let go of the antenna when it has got it all the way over the tree. One way you can do that is to take the um, antenna end, tie it to the drone, go up and over the tree and then down, and when you get down to the ground, catch that beast so it doesn't destroy itself on the antenna lead. Uh, and uh, yes, it can be made to work. Now, Amazon has hundreds of different drones, as it says here. The problem is, the less expensive a drone, the harder it is to fly. I have um, a DJI uh, Spark, which is not a cheap drone. It's $500 plus dollar drone by the time you buy the pieces that you want. Uh, and it's extremely easy to fly. And the reason is because it basically flies itself. It's got GPS in it. It's got accelerometers in it. It can stay hovered even in a pretty strong wind and only responds to your inputs, and that's the only place it'll go. If you try it with a cheaper drone, you're going to really have to become very good at flying that drone uh, because it'll be all over the sky. Uh, so, yeah. Um, there are other ways of getting antennas over it. Uh, you can use like some uh, stretchy plastic stuff to shoot a ball up and over and attach the antenna to that. Usually what people do is they'll send over a uh, fish, fishing line because it's light and then they'll use that to pull the, the actual antenna over. So, 100 bucks for a the length of wire. Yeah. Um, the problem is building them. Greetings from Serbia. Hello. Okay. Um, great video on the two meter band. Thank you. That's had a lot of views. A lot of views. Um, uh, let's see. And no, Edison took credit for all the inventions that his subordinates did. 
Every patent to come out of his laboratory had his name on it. Uh, Westinghouse, George Westinghouse was different. I mean, he kept the rights to the patent and everything, um, and but he gave credit and put the names of the people who actually did the inventions. So you look up George Westinghouse and say, well, he doesn't have so many patents. Actually, he had more than Edison. Um, like, I have two patents, uh, but IBM owns them because I did them while I worked at IBM. But they're in my name. Um, skipped over my SWR question. Um, Randman Williamson. I don't know that I have it. Um, yes, please email me again with that. I'm, I'm sorry if I skipped over it. Um, yeah, uh, tuners are really good to have. My 4010 for my antennas work great. However, I got a heaviest gauge wire from them because the first one stretched. Okay. The stretch has nothing to do with the gauge. The stretch has to do with the type of wire. A hard-drawn copper won't stretch near as much as soft-drawn copper. All house wiring, so if you're, you know, undoing Romex and using the wire from that, all house wiring is soft-drawn copper, meaning it will stretch. Now, once it's stretched, it's stretched, okay, it'll only stretch so much, and it, it does tend to harden the wire a little bit. <clears throat> but every so often, you will need to be checking that and see what's uh, going. Okay, um, oops. Fishing rods are cheaper to launch wires over trees. Not for me. I can't operate a fishing rod to save my life. I have caught a grand total of one fish in my entire life. And that was by accident when my father handed me the rod and reel while he piddled around with the engine, I caught a fish. So, uh, and the fishing line was wrapped all over that thing and dad wasn't happy. Even though we got a fish, oh well. That, that was my first and last fishing experience. What is a good mobile ham for Jeep when off-roading in the mountains? Um, well, get your license first. Um, get a, a two-meter mobile rig. All the manufacturers make them. I have a two-meter, I have several two-meter mobile rigs. I've got one in the truck, uh, one in here in the shack, and um, another one in the drawer. Um... 550 paracord. Love your Vizwar video, Dave. Thank you. He's saying his question was in the comments. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, who was that? Randman Williamson. Let me see if I can go back and find a Randman Williamson. Rand there it is. A strange problem. A diamond disc cone up 20 feet with 125 feet of RG213, that's a long distance at VHF. Um, antenna analyzer says the six meter vertical is resonant less than two. ICOM 7300 shows greater than five. Common ground on all. Oh, that's annoying, isn't it? Um, your problem is 125 feet of RG213. That's a long distance to get up to that antenna. Um, make sure that, well, most antenna analyzers do work at six meters. Um, 7300 shows great than five. I'm not sure. Are you sure something isn't loose there? Uh, or you've got a flaky connector or something like that. Um, I think that's about all I could ask about that. I mean, sometimes you just get weirdisms like that. But that is a really big weirdism. Okay. Um, just watched your quartz. Uh, this is from Phil, K7TTI. Just watched your quartzite octopus install and feel a lot better now about 
some of the fiasco antenna raisings I've had. Yeah, that was a fiasco. Um, I dropped it. It was not good for the antenna. I've been using hamsticks from MFJ. Actually, the term hamsticks belongs to another company, but MFJ has kind of picked it up as a generic term for the hamsticks. Now, um, the hamstick consists of a, a long fiberglass tube about four feet long with the wire sort of coiled around it to get to the end. And then in the middle of it, there's an actual coil uh, that's designed to be a coil. And that's the loading coil. And then you've got stingers coming out of the things. And he wanted to show me, top screen, this. Um, is what he's done. This is, you can see the wiring around this antenna here. Okay, see it's got it labeled as 40 meters. And uh, instead of having the two little uh, screws in here, which will tighten down when you get it to the right dimension, he has taken these little binding posts. It's a little thumb screw kind of thing. And then these little springs which come under here and grab this. Now with this kind of a setup, um, let's see, is there a, oops. I lost it. Phil, where's Phil? Here's Phil. Yes, okay, it's this one, I think. Yeah, I was just going to see if there were a way to enlarge that. Yes, there is. Okay, there we go. Um, so you can see the end of the, the fiberglass tube. And right here, there's uh, two little um, Allen bolts that go down in there to tighten that stinger. And the stinger goes out a certain amount. Uh, what he's done here is made something so that he can pull those out and collapse them very easily without having to get the little um, adjustment tool out of there. So he wanted to uh, uh, share that with everybody, and I think that's a really good idea. I'm going to set this aside so that I put his suggestion up on my website with credit to him, of course. Okay, we'll go back to the headshot here. All right, I've got to be faster at this. Tim K5TGS says, hope all is well. I have a two-part question. Building a kit, a go kit for Zycom 7100, which has HF and VHF. I want to run a very short cable for each to an SO239 for each, which would be on the outside of the go kit. With a short cable like six sensors or so to the connectors, cause an SWR issue? Very likely not. Um, it is a tiny bit of an SWR bump. Um, but, you know, going through a connector will take a SWR of 1.0 to 1 to about 1.1 to 1, which is really a very, very, very small change. So go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, with the octopus antenna, they actually gave me an Allen wrench for each of the antennas that came with the ham sticks, and so I had eight of them. Uh, yeah, uh, to R. Vargo. Roger, are you here? Oh, hi, Roger. Roger's a, a very, very good friend from high school. Known him for many years. Our 50th high school reunion is this year. Uh, most Jeeps have soft or non-metallic tops. And antenna choice and placement are as important as radio selection. Good point, Roger. Good point. Um, to our Vargo, I've used diamond 2 meter right rear bumper. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, through the roof, animal mount is best, magnetic mount. Okay. Should have used LMR 400. I have a 500 foot roll of 
um, LMR 400. About half of it's now out on the ground going up to antennas. I don't like it. Next time I order a roll of coax, it's going to be uh, RG213. It's not quite as good, but it is a well of a lot easier to deal with. So my voice just dropped out again for two seconds. I don't know, it, it may be bad uh, internet connection here. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, in, in, in connections are common in Europe. They are better connectors than the so-called UHF connectors, which we make um, a little. <laughs> At HF, it doesn't make that much of a difference. They can be made waterproof, which is nice. Um, they are better connectors, but in, in um, Europe, the radios are sold with end connectors. In the U.S., with uh, the SO239, PL259. Okay, um, now this is an interesting one from Chuck, KA3EHL. Uh, he is wondering how to use the GPS clock pulse into an SDR duo. Um, emailed the SDR guy and the answer was very short. He said you need to use a 24 megahertz signal. I'm assuming that you would use the GPS clock to gate in the 24 megahertz. No. Um, the little clock that comes like with uh, the QRP labs, um, I've got a little station clock here and um, here's my station clock okay and this is the GPS receiver that goes with it okay now that GPS receiver costs something like twenty dollars okay not very expensive uh, it puts out a one pulse per second output which gates the clock over here and uh, the clock keeps time to the second. Now that second is extremely accurate. It's within, um, well, at most milliseconds from GPS time, which uh, for the US military is legal time. And GPS time is within nanoseconds of UTC. Um, the United States has got to have two independent time systems. I know, it's stupid. But they do. NIST can't convince the military to use its standard time, and the military can't convince NIST to use its standard time. So the best that they do is that the two are kept extremely close. But notice that GPS is not quite UTC. UTC is civilian time in the, uh, in the United States. And UTC anyway, there is no clock anywhere in the world that reads UTC. You take the clocks at NIST, and at the Naval Observatory and all the European clocks and Japanese and so on around the world and there's an algorithm and from that you deduce what is UTC and then everybody knows okay my clock is 0.3 picoseconds slower than UTC so I'll just add that to that time. Um, it's amazing how important accurate time is in making the modern world work. Okay, anyway, diversion. By the way, I really enjoy the time thing. I've got several publications from NIST on uh, time. Uh, the, one of, in, in terms of time, in terms of jitter, there's something called an Allen variance that measures the amount of jitter in time. And uh, I know the guy, Allen, uh, that's his last name. I can't remember his first name off the top of my head, but he's, uh, I know the guy, I knew him uh, for years, uh, who invented that because I lived in the Boulder area and there were people who worked at NIST who came to the same church I did, so I got to know some of them. All right, now the problem is that the SDR Duo has an input for a GPS clock, but it wants a GPS disciplined 24 megahertz signal okay 
Now we're talking laboratory grade equipment. We're not talking 20 bucks. We're talking thousands of dollars for laboratory grade equipment, which is in and of itself basically an atomic clock that is kept synced to the GPS time. And there's all sorts of filters in there. By the way, the type is often a Kalman filter. There's filters in there that keep the phase noise down to a minimum. Now, if you feed that, uh, usually those clocks output a 10 megahertz signal, but you can get them to do other things. You put a 24 megahertz signal into the GPS Duo, and what you can do with this is if somebody has a transmitter that is also linked, you know the exact time, you, you, you can subtract out the propagation time, you can do direction finding, you can do all kinds of fun things like that. But it takes a laboratory grade GPS, um, G GPS disciplined oscillator to uh, do that. It's fun talking about, but I certainly can't afford it. I can afford the $19 one. Um, the purpose of this question is to use the SDR Duo for the frequency measuring test this fall. A um, friend of mine has the expensive GPS time base, but I didn't have those resources. I don't blame you. They're really expensive. I purchased the QRP Labs GPS module and the frequency modules as suggested by hands. Uh, good luck. Um, Here's what you do with the SDR uh, Duo. <clears throat> with one receiver measure, uh, 10 megahertz is usually the easiest uh, WWV to get. And um, you can get on the other receiver, because there's two receivers in there, the 20, or the 15, or the 5, or the 2.5, or the 25. But uh, once you do that, you can really calibrate that uh, that receiver to within well within a hertz well within a hertz and use that for your frequency measuring test and I think you'll find that you'll get outstanding results so um, let me take a look here at the um, Chicken and egg dilemma with UTC and NIST. Yeah, well, the Naval Observatory came first. Um, okay. 75 ohm RG6, yes. Uh, RG6 is so much cheaper than anything else because RG6 is used in cable TV and you can go down to Home Depot and just buy loads of the stuff for not very much money. And it's 75 ohm and you connect it and put a tuner in you're not going to know the difference. Um, what is the radio behind or supporting the GPS? Oh! Um... I have another little radio here. I actually had two GPS's up there. One goes to the clock. The other goes to my whisper transmitter. That's my whisper transmitter right there. And so that's held extremely closely to the transmit frequencies. And that's on pretty much all the time. And then that's my FTDX 3000 below it. And my 2 meter rig. This is 2 meters and 440. It's a uh, Yesu FT7800. I think they sell the 7900 now. But it's pure analog radio. It doesn't have any, any uh, digital bells or whistles. Okay, this is from uh, Jamie Hughes, uh, WA7JH. Said he watched episode 204. He works for High Terra and would love to provide me with more information surrounding DMR. I would love that. If interested, let me know. Yes, I'm interested. Hytera is the largest commercial DMR manufacturer in the world. Let me know if I can help. Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, DMR is a bit of a black art, and any help I can get, I appreciate on that. 
And I'm going to put that one aside to give you a personal reply. Yeah, this one is from James. Um, I have a project idea if you're interested. He wants a station clock. He wants to build his own using a Raspberry Pi. I wouldn't count on the clock and the Raspberry Pi being terribly accurate. So you're going to want to check uh, external sources fairly frequently for that. But you can do that over the internet. He wants local time and UTC. He wants uh, daylight savings time to be enabled and so on. Um, here. Here's the clock you want. Um, I got this from Walmart. Um, it doesn't have much in the way of uh, it says time link. Got this at Walmart. It's the only clock they have that will do a 24 hour readout. All the others just do 12. It has an alarm built in if you need it. Um, it will um, uh, give you the temperature. Oh, it's in centigrade. I've got to go change that. And um, the month, day, and the time. And I have it set for UTC. Now the problem with this clock is it's not linked to anything, so it has to be physically reset from time to time. So this clock still sits in my station um, under the uh, uh, under the clock that's uh, got the GPS link, and um, I don't know. I could probably take it to Swap Fest. I don't use it anymore, but. Um, uh, that's what I would do. If you want to build your own with a Raspberry Pi, by all means, uh, do it. And do a video about it so we can see what you're doing. Uh, let me know uh, what you've done, and uh, I'll uh, spread the word on my website. Um, okay, that's the project idea. Um... This is from Gregory Forster, again, KD9JTI. Uh, question on grounding. Some hams insist that the ground, equipment grounding block, which is my station single point ground that's right behind the radios here, which is a bad misnomer because my ground rod outside is my station single point ground too, but whatever. Uh, some hams insist that the equipment grounding block should be grounded to the antenna ground. Yes. It should be taken to a ground rod outside, near the shack, uh, right where the wires go into the house. And that could be right next to your ham station or wherever it's convenient for you. And then that's where you put the lightning arresters, there, so you don't get lightning in the house. The way I look at it is to not make sense to ground the equipment grounding block to the antenna ground. Say there is a lightning stroke, strike you have your coax disconnected from the radio when the lightning goes down the antenna ground. Couldn't it travel the ground back to the equipment grounding block and blow out whatever equipment's grounded to the grounding block? Um, ground it anyway, because uh, if there is a lightning strike, you're going to get a voltage transient uh, on everything. And the idea, if you do things right, I've got switches with, or coax switches with grounds in them, plus lightning arresters, as a matter of fact, uh, makes them kind of expensive. But I've got them set up here so that if there's a voltage transient, the whole station follows the voltage transient. So there aren't parts of the station that say, say, stay stuck to the utility ground, but don't follow the transient of the lightning pulse. You want everything to follow the transient. Okay, and that's why we ground things, and so on. So, um, best practice, I can say this with assurity, best practice is to ground that grounding block to your station single point ground, which is where you bring all of your coax cables, and you have all of your lightning arresters, one for each cable. I have six out there. So, yeah, don't, don't, don't mess with best practices on grounding. Watch my grounding video. I've got a reference in there to a Motorola book that talks about communications grounds and how they're done. 
and it's an outstanding resource and something you can check out. Okay, we're down to our last one. Um, hello, Dave. First of all, thanks um, for providing this email address. The email address is hamradioanswers at gmail.com. Please feel free to use it. Uh, normally, I check it on Saturdays before the live stream, but I'll also take a look in uh, during the week just to see what's uh, in there. Um, for, and the, the, the thing about the, the, um, that particular email address is if you want to attach a picture, like we've seen a couple of here, um, okay, if you want to attach a picture, you can do that. You can't do that on the web form on Ask Dave. Um, a question about the need for an antenna analyzer. Mm. I'm going to purchase my first cobweb antenna from MFJ to cover most of the bands and I do not have an analyzer. Okay, what you're going to have to do with that particular antenna because it must be tuned. Uh, once you get it tuned, it'll stay tuned for the bands, but you're going to need an antenna analyzer. And where do you get one? Uh, our club has an MFJ antenna analyzer that belongs to the club and anybody can borrow it as long as they return it. So, uh, you know, nowadays um, most people have their own, but um, I didn't have an antenna analyzer for many, many, many years. Um, and uh, so it's available to borrow at the club if you need it. So check out your local club. Some of them have, uh, you know, interesting little pieces of test equipment. Or check out a, another ham that you get to know who can maybe come over to your house with his and help you set up that antenna. It's easier to have two people to set up the antenna because that thing has to be taken down, adjusted, put back up, tested, all that kind of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Do you think I can use the new antenna right out of the box without doing any harm to my transmitter? No. Um, now your transmitter has an SWR meter in it too, probably. And push comes to shove, you can use that to do the adjustments. Do it at low power. Um, and uh, says you won't be able to purchase an analyzer for quite some time. I, I very much understand. Uh, borrow one from a friend or from your local club. Well, I'm getting down there. Um, thank you so much for watching this. Please do me a favor and, and take a moment after you're done to click like. Uh, it really helps me. Uh, I know it seems like a, a, a broken record that I'm constantly asking for it, but uh, YouTube looks at the number of likes and the number of subscriptions and so on in, in determining whether to recommend this channel to uh, other people. Uh, also, if you are not a subscriber, I'd appreciate it if you'd become one. Becoming a subscriber is your vote of confidence to YouTube in my channel. In addition, if you click the little bell uh, that comes up after you subscribe, that's the notifications bell. If you click that so that it gets little sounds on the side, um, then you can get a notification of any new material, however you've got your YouTube notification set up to work. Email, something on your mobile, uh, something like that. So thank you very, very much. By the way, uh, MFJ is sending me one of their little, it's an MFJ1234. Uh, it's a remote, a little box built on a Raspberry Pi with 16,000 little connectors to it that can connect to your radio and allow you to operate remotely from anywhere you can get to the internet. Uh, with, a, you know, you can use your iPad, use your um, your computer whatever you want to do so um, I've been asked to test it and review it and we'll see how that looks so that looks quite interesting UK has GMT in British summertime yes um, nobody other than the British calls it uh, GMT anymore um, it's uh, the military sometimes it's called Zulu which is again a um, nickname it's uh, UTC. Now, there is a difference between GMT and UTC. Um, GMT is Britain's time. UTC is world time. So GMT is the British 
uh, input to UTC. Uh, again, we're talking nanoseconds of difference. Uh, also, GMT is, is well, um, we don't need to do time dissertation. It takes too much time. Um, do they give tours of that antenna farm at NIST in Colorado? Uh, it, they will. There's, um, I think it's in October. Uh, the 100th anniversary of WWV is coming up, and they're going to be doing some special things. There'll be a week-long uh, special event station and so on, and they'll be doing uh, tours and so on. Uh, so it's something to take a look at. Um, let's see. Yes, use the drone to pull the fishing line and so on. Do you plan, and hello to Barnacle Brad. I know he's one of my uh, best uh, Patreon supporters. Do you plan to attend HamCon 2000? It's here in Colorado next year. No, it's a ways off. Well, it's in Colorado. Uh, send me an email with more information. MFJ sells several good clocks. Arduino would make a better clock than Raspberry Pi. Uh, Johan Smith, is CW a tone being sent out or just a carrier or clean signal? It is a carrier. And the way information is sent is just the presence or absence of the carrier. So you need something in the receiver, since you wouldn't normally hear a carrier. Um, you need something called a beat frequency oscillator that will um, create a tone whenever there's a carrier. And that's what you actually use to listen to CW. Uh, good question. Some enterprising kid entrepreneur come up with the station clock uh, that's a replica of the Back to the Future dashboard of the DeLorean. Yeah, I guess so. What budget HF transceiver would you recommend to a new ham? And does a G5 RV need to be grounded in some way? The G5 RV is a balanced antenna. And no, it wouldn't be grounded. But if you go through your ballon, you're going to end up grounding it. Um, a budget HF transceiver you can buy used. I don't recommend buying used because you're buying somebody else's problem. And make sure you purchase a relatively recent radio. Uh, the 7300, the ICOM 7300, is usually available for under $1,000. It's a very nice radio. The Yaesu FT450 is several hundred dollars less than that. Uh, it's a good radio. My friend Roger has the Olinko, uh DSR-8, I think, uh, that um, is an HF radio that's even more less expensive. They all work. Gathering electrical plastic pipe components for running. Um, <laughs> I run my antenna just strung out on the ground. I know that's not a very good idea, but I keep changing things. Uh, liked and sub Dave. Thank you. Tech videos have been helpful. Generals are interesting and having a blast learning. I am really going to update the generals. Uh, they're eight years out of date, but they're not that much different. Uh, the one thing that is different is the digital modes. They put a lot more emphasis on digital modes. Can you compare the Brig Pi with Remote Ham software? Uh, not yet. Thanks for the interesting live stream. Have a safe ride. You put a penny in the slots for me, if they still have penny slots. UTC or GPS time? Um, well, my clock reads GPS time, so, and it's within a nanosecond, a few nanoseconds of UTC, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, okay, uh, very good. So I'm going to say 73. It has been great meeting with you today, interacting with you. I really love this event on Saturday. Um, I'll try to do something next week if I can. Uh, go to the live stream page, and I should have a, a banner up there whether or not I'm going to be able to do it. So, 73, and we will see you all next week. And I hope to have a short video out this week, even though we'll be traveling. So, talk to you soon. 73.